everyone. Welcome to MH Fay England's Neurodiversity Session for Thrive London. My name is Jane McNeese. I'm going to be taking you through the slides and information today. Just to give you a little bit of background about my role as an MH Fay instructor, I've, I've been an MH Fay instructor now since 2009 and I've worked in mental health and employment since 2008. Um, for 12 years of that time, I've also been a mental health first aid uh, England associate. So I've delivered quite a lot of courses for for them and I deliver MHFA training courses on a weekly basis um, pretty much all of the courses with the exception of the armed forces MHFA course um, so I'm familiar with what you've undertaken already in terms of your MHFA qualification hopefully what I'll be able to do today is to add some knowledge um, and skills um, for your role as a mental health first aider in the context of neurodiversity so we start the session with a little icebreaker. I'm just going to move the slides on. And uh, the icebreaker is to think about how long it is you've been an MHF aider and whether you have supported anyone who has disclosed that they are in, uh, neurodivergent during that time. And if that was the case, did you feel your MHF aider skills were adequate and effective in supporting that person? So how, how do you feel they kind of um, stood up to that? Um, did you feel there was any gaps in, in understanding or, or knowledge? OK. In terms of accessibility and inclusion of our training course today, I just want to talk you through some of the terms that we're going to be using. So we will talk quite a lot about neurodiversity, neurodivergence, neurotypical, neurotype. Now, in terms of what we mean by these uh, these words, if you were to substitute the word neuro uh, with the word brain, it kind of explains these a little bit more. So when we're talking about neurodiverse, we're talking about um, diverse brains and we all have different brain types. So when we're talking about neurodiversity, we all have neurodiversity. When we're talking about neurodivergent or divergent brain, what we're talking about is people who have a different brain type, which is not the brain type that the majority of the population have. Um, so we would be a minority group. We've then got the term neurotypical. Um, in that, we'd be thinking about the typical brain. So again, the type of brain that the majority of the population have. And when we're talking about neurotype, we're talking about any type of brain. We've then got a couple of other terms, uh, autistic, which many people have heard of, but you might all also hear the word allistic and allistic just um, relates to people who don't have autism. So it's the non-autistic population. I will use some acronyms during the session slides and where I do, I will always endeavour to explain those so that you can understand them. Um, but during the live session, I will be giving people the opportunity to pause and ask for further explanation. For anybody watching this afterwards, um, by all means, email me if there's something that I've not given full clarity on. I do encourage you to think about personal safety, whether you are watching this uh, or part of this live or whether you're watching this film afterwards. One of the things that can inevitably happen is when we share information about neurodivergence and when we share lived experience stories, it is possible that some people hearing and seeing that will actually self-identify. Now, I do want to say that self-identification is different to self-diagnosis. As you will all know from your MHFA training course, it's not possible to, uh, to self-diagnose without professional qualification. But there is always a possibility that people start to self-identify, they hear the information and they recognise that within themselves. And if that's the case for some people who are watching this today, um, one thing I would say is MHF England are there as a support. Um, I am if people contact uh, me as the trainer. And uh, for some people, you may need to talk to other professionals about the information that has, has come to light. And obviously, your choice then is to uh, whether to pursue that further or not. But there is always that possibility. But we just want to remind you that there is support available um, if that happens for you. So we're going to start with a quiz. We've got seven statements and I'm going to bring them up on slides individually and I'm going to ask you to think about whether they are true or false. So very similar to the quizzes that you would have done in your MHFA training course. Some are slightly different, but on the whole, they are true or false uh, statements. So the first one is neurodivergent conditions are mental health conditions, true or false? 
the answer to this is false. Neurodiverse conditions are featured in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual Volume 5 and the International Classification of Diseases Volume 11. So they are classed as clinical diagnoses, but they are not classed as mental health conditions. They form a different branch of diagnosis, but you would find them in those manuals. Statement two, neurodivergent conditions are curable. True or false? The answer is false. Neurodiverse conditions are permanent. They're not episodic. Um, in mental health first aid, we talk a lot about episodic mental health conditions and development recovery phases. With neurodivergent conditions, they are permanent. They are a, a brain type, a neurotype. Um, so uh, it's not something we can cure um, or change specifically. And actually the neurodiverse community will often reject ideas and organizations that are centered around curing neurodivergence. And if you look at neurodivergence um, historically, um, you will find more ideas around cure and what people have done to try and cure uh, neurodivergence. Um, I could recommend a book by Steve Silverman called uh, Neurotribes if you want to understand the history around neurodivergence a little bit more. Statement three, people who are neurodivergent are more likely to experience mental health difficulties. True or false? The answer is true. So if we just take one example, um, we know that 80% of autistic people will experience a mental health issue during their lives. This is quite interesting in the context of mental health first aid, because one of the things you will have learned quite early on in your training course is that um, mental illness affects one in, in four people. So what we're talking about here is a much higher statistical probability of someone with autism or any other neurodivergence in experiencing a mental health difficulty. So it's highly possible in your support role that you might be supporting someone who is either diagnosed or undiagnosed neurodivergent. Statement four, my mental health first aid skills won't be enough to support neurodivergent people. True or false? False. So mental health first aid skills are adaptable to meet, pe uh, meet all people experiencing mental health difficulties, regardless of the cause, whether that is their brain type or some other factor that might have, have triggered their mental illness. However, you can be more effective as an MHFA if you can support a person's neurodiverse needs. So a little bit of a light bulb point on this one as well is to think about the frame of reference. I am gonna encourage you to think about what you remember about the frame of reference here. So a little bit of a refresher for yourself. Um, if you don't recall much about it, go back and have a look in your manual um, and read a little bit more on that because it's quite fundamental to this. Um, so what I'm trying to encourage you to think about here is both your frame of reference and the frame of reference of the person you're supporting. Um, so what we're really talking about here is having a person-centered approach a person-centered approach would encourage us to think about what that person needs and to ask those questions if we are unsure. So that's key to this. So again, I would encourage you to have a look at the, the frame of reference. Statement five, neurodivergent people may need a different approach. True or false? Trick question on this one. So ALGE, the MHFA Action Plan, can be used flexibly to support neurodivergent people, but they may require other supports. Things that might be less of an issue for a neurotypical person may be more of a problem for a neurodivergent person. So I've given you an example here. Um, one of the things uh, that some uh, neurodivergent people will experience is slower processing of information. So sometimes people will need a little bit more time to process the information that you give them. Um, keep in mind the G in the algae there, give information and support. Person might need a bit more processing time um, in respect of that information. Oh, popping up twice on that one. Statement six, which model from your MHFA course will be important to keep in mind when supporting neurodivergent people? I think we've possibly answered this one already. So again, key to this is the frame of reference, but do keep in mind some of the other key models, the stress container um, and the experience of stress by neurodivergent people and also the mental health continuum and the, the manoeuvre around that continuum as well, which for some people may be more quick. Um, there will be other uh, things to consider there. 
And again, popping up twice. Um, I'm going to take from that that we need to um, definitely keep that in mind and reiterate it. OK. Oh, one more. Uh, what neurodivergent conditions have you all heard of? So if we're doing this on the live session, we'd be encouraging you to pop those in the chat. And hopefully we should have a list that incorporates some of these. Um, there's some possibly more familiar ones on there and a few of the labels that might be less familiar to people. And we're going to explore not all, but um, some of the key ones within our session today. And um, there's a lot of literature out there if you did want to look in some of these other areas as well. And if you need any direction on that, um, if you were to get in touch with MHFA England, we can um, direct you a little bit further. And again, we're just seeing some of those labels around the uh, brain here. Um, under that heading of neurodiversity. So what is neurodivergence? I mentioned earlier that the um, neurodivergent people in society are the minority. They have a different brain type than neurotypicals. And the brain type that they have is permanent. So it's not curable. It doesn't go away. Um, and that's when we're talking about that bigger area of, of neurodiversity. Now, in terms of um, the brain itself, the neurodivergent brain has basically developed on a different trajectory to the neurotypical brain. And there are a number of different reasons that are um, cited as, uh, as being the cause of that. Um, but I would say um, the research is varied. I don't think we're totally at the bottom of all that, but there are strong leanings towards genetics. Um, I've come across research that suggests 35% genetic on some conditions, up to 95%. Um, the other factors are things like intrauterine exposure, and we're talking about there the kinds of chemicals and things that the um, embryo is exposed to in the womb. So if a, a parent has been using substances, for example, and that substance has, has gone through the amniotic fluid, that could be a factor. And we also know that trauma can um, impact the brain and change the brain as well. So that can be a factor within it. Um, but certainly a lot of research I've come across around genetics, particularly in the context of um, autism. Now, there's lots of other conditions that neurodivergent people will be experiencing, and they actually may be fundamental to their experiences around their mental health as well. Um, there's a long list, but just to highlight some of these, um, coexisting conditions will include things like um, gastric problems, very, very common in neurodivergence, um, things like migraines from sensory overload in some cases, We'd also be looking at mental illness, um, anxiety being um, uh, strongly linked to a number of different um, neurodivergent conditions and other mental illnesses as well. So mental illness is very commonly a, a coexisting factor. Uh, eating disorders, particularly in the context of um, neurodivergence, uh, particularly autism. Uh, for example, strongly linked with uh, anorexia. So there's lots of coexisting conditions and some of these co uh, coexisting conditions could be contributing to um, someone's anxiety levels and their mood levels, for example. Now, there's a lot of myth around neurodivergence and myths around specific types of neurodivergence. And some of the common ones are that people who are neurodivergent um, are lower in intelligence or lower in IQ. But we actually find that many people who are neurodivergent do have exceptionally high IQ as well. Um, there is a greater precedence of things like learning disability in some conditions like autism, but there's also the, the other sort of side of that as well. And there are also many people who are of um, what we would regard as normal intelligence. Um, so we can't always presume that someone with a neurodivergent condition has a, a learning disability because it won't always be the case. Now, um, one thing you would have learned in your MHFA course is that uh, mental health conditions are covered under the Equality Act as a disability. And the definition of a disability under the Equality Act is where the um, illness is long term and impacts a person's day to day living. Now, we know that neurodivergence is permanent. So it is going to be long term. And we know from many, many people who are neurodivergent that it impacts their day to day living in some uh, cases very, very considerably. So I'd be very, very surprised if there was any situation where someone wouldn't be covered under the Equality Act. And what that Equality Act requires us to do is to make reasonable adjustments for people with um, disabilities um, as employers. And um, with reasonable adjustments, we need to be thinking about the benefit of the adjustment for that individual 
the impact on the rest of the team, the cost of that adjustment, whether we have it in the budget. And if we don't have it in the budget, have we explored things like DWP funding, uh, such as access to work, um, to actually cover those costs? And we generally find a lot of reasonable adjustments are not that costly anyway. Um, it could be a small change that is really helpful for a neurodivergent person. Um, so my general rule on reasonable adjustments is treat it as if someone is covered and go the extra mile, um, because ultimately the only people who will tell you whether an adjustment is reasonable or not is an employment tribunal, and it's not the best place to, to find out. OK, um, other considerations are around stigma and stereotyping. There is a lot of stigma and prejudice around uh, disabilities, including neurodivergent ones, and also stereotyping, particularly because um, there's a lot of ill information out there and a lot of information that people have gained has come from the media. And it's not always given a representative portrayal of neurodivergent people. So if you take, for example, something like autism, most people's understanding of autism has probably come from the film Rain Man. Um, and there might be a presumption that everyone with autism is exceptionally genius at maths. Um, Rain Man, for example, had savant, uh, savant syndrome. And um, so he was exceptional, but he is also 1% of the autistic population, a minority minority. Um, so we do need to think about this more representatively and really get that accurate information and dispel some of the myths, um, which wouldn't be particularly different from what we've needed to do for a very long time and still need to do in, in mental health. Um, I'm sure you'll all recall your graffiti wall activity within MHFA. So just talking about language um, when it comes to neurodivergence, you will find the neurodivergent community will have different thinking. Um, but again, I would still keep in mind the person centred approach. Um, generally speaking, when we think about the neurodivergent area of autism, the autistic community will lean towards phrases of I am autistic. Um, they tend to reject I'm on a spectrum or I suffer from autism or I have autism. They will say it's a fundamental part of their identity and they will use first person language. But you will find the exception as well. Um, again, if we're not sure, ask the, the person we're supporting. And in the context of other areas of neurodiversity, you might hear I have a diagnosis of ADHD or I have dyslexia, or I am dyslexic. So we still might come across first person language there as well. Or I have dyspraxia. Um, so again, person centered approach. Um, with autistic spectrum conditions, um, we do tend to use the word condition nowadays, and that tends to be the diagnosis that will go on someone's um, assessment report. Again, the community is steering away from words like disorder because they don't want their autism to be regarded as a disorder, but rather a condition or a difference. Um, but some people will reject the word difference and say, no, it is a, a disability. Um, so we do have some little nuances in there, um, as I say, person centred approach. Um, so what would that person centred approach encourage us to do? What might you need to do? I'll leave that one with you to to think about. So the conditions, um, we looked at a list of, of these earlier. So these are the ones we're going to have a look through a little bit more today, um, probably less so the, the last uh, line there, um, more so the ones that are above that. So we'll break these down a little bit further for you. So um, starting with um, dyslexia, dyspraxia, dyscalculia and dysgraphia, and I don't always know if I pronounce dyscalculia pr uh, correctly, um, dyscalcula, sometimes it, it comes across as, um, um, but yeah. That, that's uh, one of the conditions. All of these are classed as a learning disability. Um, if we were thinking about dyslexia, we're looking at a condition here where there are difficulties with the sight of words and, and those difficulties might present challenges in terms of a person learning to read, the speed at which they read, how easily they can read words. So for some uh, people who have dyslexia, the words might jump around on the page. And as you can imagine, that would make that quite difficult to, um, to read and to fully comprehend and understand it. 
dyslexia is not linked to intelligence, um, but it can make learning difficult. And usually with the right learning aids, um, the person can learn in the usual way. They just need those ad um, adaptations. And I know at least a couple of people who have dyslexia who are very intelligent people and outstanding in the way they, they work. Um, both of them incidentally are MHV instructors um, and they use different aids to get around their dyslexia. And sometimes part of that is to explain to the delegate group that they have dyslexia um, so that there is some understanding there as well. The second one is dyspraxia. Now, this is a brain based motor disorder. So what this one's going to affect is things like fine and gross motor skills, uh, things like coordination. So someone with dyspraxia might find that they have lots of bumps and scrapes, uh, maybe a little bit more clumsy um, and have difficulties in that area. And again, whilst it can affect someone's cognitive skills, it's not actually related to intelligence. Um, so someone could be um, of high intelligence or normal intelligence. Um, it doesn't particularly affect that. We've then got the condition dyscalculia, if I pronounce that correctly. Um, and this is where someone will have um, almost like the difficulties someone has with dyslexia in the context of words, but this time with numbers and mathematics. Um, and they're not generally caused by a lack of access to education in maths, um, but the person might not achieve at the level that is expected for their age. Um, so they might have various difficulties with numbers and understanding numbers, um, group situations. I can tell you that um, I don't have this diagnosis, but I have suspected dyscalculia. And as a mental health first aid instructor, sometimes I find putting people into groups quite difficult. Um, very basic numbers, but I really struggle with those. So I've had to put coping mechanisms in place to be able to address that. So this is my uh, sort of area. Um, We've then got the condition dysgraphia. Now, dysgraphia is characterized by a person who might have difficulty um, converting the sounds of language into a written form. So they might have ideas in their head, but not be able to put that down on paper. Or if they are able to put that down on paper, they might have difficulty with writing or writing that might not appear legible to other people. And it generally um, starts to appear. In fact, many of these conditions start to be discovered when a child goes to school, because that's usually the forum where we're going to be asked to demonstrate these skills. So what, a lot of these things get, uh, can get picked up once a child starts school and they might have difficulty with writing, they might have all fantastic ideas and knowledge, but not be able to translate that onto paper with ease. So next, we would be playing the film What is Dyslexia by the Dyslexia Association. So you've got the links there that will allow, allow you to do that. And then we move on to Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, otherwise referred to as ADHD. Um, ADHD is a developmental disorder associated with an ongoing pattern of inattention, hyperactivity and or impulsivity. Not everyone receives a diagnosis of ADHD. Sometimes people might receive the diagnosis um, ADD, attention deficit disorders. So they don't have the hyperactivity side of that. So there are variances to this as well. From a numbers point of view, um, it's estimated that the prevalence in adults is about 2.5% of the population. And um, just to explain the different areas of this, um, the inattention, obviously someone having difficulty with paying attention, maybe concentration levels. The hyperactivity is where that person will have almost too much energy, um, maybe moving quite quickly, talking too much, um, and often impulsivity as well. So impulsive type behaviours or behaviours that illustrate a lack of, of self-control. So it's got various different challenges within the condition. Um, just to break these down a little bit further, um, again, we might see in the workplace things that might look like careless mistakes or concentration issues, but it's actually the condition that is, is presenting a challenge for that individual. Um, things like sustaining attention for long periods of time. So if a task requires um, lengthy concentration, maybe something like a report or something that's really detailed, that might be a challenge for that individual or they might need information breaking down in a different way. Um, listening closely when spoken to directly to try and uh, get over those um, concentration difficulties, um, following instructions and finishing duties in the workplace. So again, there might be challenges in that area as well, or perhaps managing time and estimating the time an activity might take could be quite challenging as well. Um, losing things is quite a common trait that we 
come across in people with ADHD. So they might have to use coping mechanisms like anchoring techniques to uh, learn to remember certain things and other sort of aids that will help that. Um, being easily distracted by stimuli, uh, things like noise, light, uh, maybe a loud bang, totally um, switching off the concentration um, and just generally being uh, forgetful in a number of different things. So it could be an, a really important appointment or remembering to pay something that needs doing at a certain time. And again, coping mechanisms are often required to actually address some of these areas. But it might perceive, be perceived differently by the outside world to what is actually going on for that individual. Um, the signs of uh, hyperactivity and impulsivity may include um, a restlessness, difficulty, maybe sitting or staying still for long periods of time, and sometimes exhausting other people with the activity as well or the speaking. Uh, fidgeting, tapping hands squirming, just that general sort of restlessness, um, being unable to engage in an activity quietly as well, maybe quite noisy in terms of engagement, um, excessive talking and answering questions before they are completed or finishing someone's sentences for them. Um, sometimes uh, waiting to take their turn is a factor as well and not knowing when it is their turn to talk um, or interrupting at inappropriate times and not recognising that need to, to, to be aware of that. And again, we've got a film that illustrates ADHD a little bit more as well from PsychHub. Moving on to our, uh, autism and Asperger's syndrome, I've grouped these two together for some reasons that I will come to explain. So um, you may well have heard of both of these diagnoses. Now, just to say Asperger's syndrome has been removed from the International Classification of Diseases Volume 11 as of January this year. And it had already been removed from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, Volume 5, DSM-5. And some of the reasons for that is because there is quite a significant overlap with autism. And I think there's also been some question marks around high functioning and low functioning paradigms that people with Asperger's are high functioning and everyone else with autism is low functioning. And also some links between Hans Asperger's history and um, a link between that and, and Nazi atrocities. So people are wanting to distance themselves from Hans Asperger and the um, diagnosis that follows his name. Um, so it has been removed, but I think we need to be very aware that some people were diagnosed with Asperger's and will fully identify with that label. So we need to keep in mind that person centred approach uh, when we're supporting. Now, just going by the fact that we've removed it from the diagnostic manuals means that as of this year, there won't be any more diagnoses of it. In theory, there might be the odd one that I think that will seep through. Um, so over time, as people with Asperger's pass away, it will remove itself. And what you will find is those that would have been diagnosed Asperger's will now be diagnosed with autistic spectrum condition. So by nature of that, we're going to see an increase in autism diagnosis. I think we're going to do anyway. Um, but that will be one of the reasons that sit behind it. Um, the other reasons include things like a lot of late diagnosis taking place at the moment and particularly amongst females. So um, various reasons as, as to why that's been removed, but there, there is an overlap with the um, condition as, as well. And we'll come on to that. So just to tell you a little bit more about how Asperger's would have been seen and, and how it's diagnosed and, and, and what we would be thinking about. So with Asperger's, generally, there would be uh, signs that include poorly coordinated motor skills leading to clumsiness and awkwardness. So not too dissimilar in that respect to dyspraxia. The main difference between Asperger's and what would have been seen as other forms of autism would be that the person with Asperger's would have strong verbal and intellectual skills. And again, that's where I think we've seen this high functioning paradigm sort of uh, uh, seeping in there. Um, a child or an adult with Asperger's will often have obsessive interest in a single object or, or topic to the exclusion of everything else, sometimes to the exclusion of self-care as well. Um, repetitive routines or rituals, patterns of behaviour, sometimes peculiarities in uh, their speech and language. And I would say with conditions like autism and Asperger's, um, speech and language factors tend to be the things that, that pick children up quite early with these conditions. Um, we would also expect to see socially different behaviour that people may view as inappropriate, um, sometimes with, with Asperger's as well, um, not understanding things like social cues 
and also uh, issues into uh, with interacting successfully with others so sometimes uh, relationship challenges there can also be issues with nonverbal communication because people with Asperger's and people with autism will often struggle with um, understanding facial expressions, um, nonverbal cues, social cues, which can be quite a challenge as well. Just bear with me. I'm just going to move that drop down box. Um, and again, the clumsiness and, and lack of coordination that we might see with uh, dyspraxia. So you start to see the overlap between a lot of these uh, conditions as well. Now, the key three areas that stand out in terms of a diagnosis of As uh, Asperger's as it was, is that people with Asperger's have an ability to recognise patterns easily. They are pattern spotters, pattern seekers. The second one is a strong ability to focus and pay attention to detail. Someone with this diagnosis will spot the detail everyone else misses, and it will be such a fine level of detail in, in some cases. And they are often highly determined individuals. So we're looking at a, a level of persistence that might even appear stubborn, um, high levels of determination there. So moving on to the area of autism. So as I say, people who would have been ordinarily diagnosed with Asperger's will now come under this heading instead and um, would get the diagnosis ASC, Autistic Spectrum Condition. Again, we're shifting away from that word disorder there. Numbers wise, one to two percent of the population um, is what the World Health Organization tells us. Uh, the National Autistic Society uh, reference sort of about 1.57 uh, in reality. However, um, based on the research that exists at the moment, it's highly likely that, that there are a lot of undiagnosed people with autism living out there with all the challenges that we're going to talk about. Simon Baron Cohen and his team at Cambridge University performed some, uh, some research a couple of years ago, and they did an online survey, uh, survey of 70, uh, sorry, losing my ability to speak, I'll explain why in due course, Um did an online survey of 750,000 people. And of those people who undertook that survey, 11.6 of them actually met the cutoff criteria for autism. And over half of those people were women. Based on that information, if that is a representative sample, and that was actually quite a big group, it was one of the largest scale uh, piece of research that has ever taken place. If that was representative of entire society, and my personal belief is that it, it's a big enough sample to, to make that case, is that um, what it's telling us is that there are more undiagnosed autistic people out there than diagnosed. We'd be looking at roughly 9%. Uh, maths isn't my strong point, but um, roughly 9%. Um, I mentioned savant syndrome earlier, which is the condition that uh, Rainman had, um, Raymond Babbitt. And uh, it's also the condition that a gentleman called Stephen Wiltshire has. You might have heard of him. Um, he's usually taken on an helicopter flight over a major city and in the following 24 hours will draw a cityscape in incredible detail because he's got a photographic memory. He is 1% of that 1.2%. Um, so minority, minority, minority. Um, so that's the condition savant syndrome. But most people with autism don't have savant. They're not what we could, would call savants. So what is the condition? The condition is all social, all social challenge. The person will have um, very often social communication difficulties, social interaction difficulties, and often um, lack social imagination, which will mean they live to very often rules, quite rigid patterns, and will often need to rule out the unknowns. Um, sometimes people with autism can't see consequence. Children might not see consequence with autism. Um, because they can't predict it at that level um, because of that lack of social imagination. It doesn't mean an autistic person um, doesn't have an imagination. Uh, very often autistic people are very visual, um, but they can lack that social imagination uh, to predict future um, events. Now, we're going to dispel possibly a little bit of myth here. Um, very often you'll hear this phrase, the autistic spectrum or autism spectrum. And in people's minds, very often, I think they visualize a line uh, with 
more artistic at one end and less artistic at the other. Um, first thing first, I'm going to say you're not a little bit artistic, just the same way that a person isn't a little bit bipolar or a little bit OCD, um, obsessive compulsive disorder. You either are or you're not. Um, saying you're a little bit artistic is a little bit like saying um, I'm feeling bloated. I've had a big meal. I'm pregnant. Nah, you either are or you're not. And um, so I want to dispel that one. First of all, no one is a little bit autistic. And secondly, artistic, uh, artistic people are not at one or the other end of a, a line. What we are is people who have um, spiky profiles, um, as you can see by the, the color wheel in front of you here. So if you break autism down into its different components, you'd be looking at motor skills, language, sensory skills, perception, things like executive functioning. And some people will have greater difficulties and strengths in different areas. So if you take one person, they will have one spiky profile. Someone else will have another one and it ends up looking like a constellation of stars. So one of the things we generally say around autism is if you've met one person with autism, then you've met that one person with autism because the next autistic person will have a different spiky profile. Um, but I do generally find there are many, many common threads that run across, again, the social, social, social that we've just talked about. So challenges uh, under social communication. The first would be things like not appreciating social uh, uses or pleasure of communication, verbal communication. Um, I generally find that autistic people find other modes of communication that they find more easy um, and they become quite good at it as well. Um, writing, for example, music. Um, sometimes people with autism will talk at people rather than to them. Um, you might find they have quite a monotone um delivery as well um sometimes there can be difficulties in expressing emotions or feelings saying how they feel or actually understanding their own feelings there is a condition called alexithemia where the person doesn't actually recognize those feelings and and finds it impossible to communicate them to other people um uh, sometimes understanding the beliefs of others as well uh, can be a challenge in understanding those those emotions. Reading gestures, facial expressions, as we mentioned, is another challenging area for autistic people and understanding other people's tone of voice or those kind of inflections in people's speech. And then we've got the social interaction challenges. Um, these tend to centre around um, sometimes inappropriate touching, sometimes sensory seeking of, of, of self um, or sensory seeking from um, other things, maybe putting hands in glue or gunky stuff because of that sensory seeking, sometimes spinning around, uh, we see that. We've got the crossover here as well with uh, what we call stims, self-stimulating behaviour. You'll find a lot of artistic people have stims and they could be vocal stims. So it might be noises that that person needs to make. Um, and also there is something called echoalia, so the repeating of words and phrases, but it could also be spinning around or spinning objects around. Um, or going on the swings. That's a, a, a stim for some people. And the person might also have difficulty in understanding, again, the nonverbal body language, um, facial expressions. Sometimes an autistic person will have issues around space and personal space. Now, we often think of the five senses, but actually there are more than five. We've also got things like the proprioceptive sense and the interoceptive sense. And what these center around is understanding our own bodily sensations. So sometimes autistic people won't recognize when they need to go to the bathroom until it's too late because they're not picking up on their own bodily sensations. And we might also find that sometimes autistic people might talk very close or come very close to the person. So they might be in your bubble, if you like, because they can't recognize that, that distance to another object. Um, sometimes um, we see children with autism or undiagnosed autism who tiptoe walk. And that is about the sensation of the floor under the feet. Um, so there's, there's lots of other sensations and uh, senses factors that, that come into autism as well. Uh, sometimes autistic people will be unaware of different social relationships and how they operate or the hierarchy of situations. And again, that might come into play quite significantly within the workplace. Um, we do generally find people with autism might struggle with relationships, including friendships, and may not have many or any friends. Um, they might just find extreme difficulty with relationships or sustaining long term relationships um, because, again, the condition is so heavily uh, socially challenged um, in its in its nature. 
Um, and again, uh, social cues we've mentioned, and um, there's often with with autistic people a real strong need to follow rules and stick to rules, and um, sometimes a frustration if other people aren't following rules, and uh, we, we tend to be good rule followers. Um, and then challenges of low, uh, lack of social imagination, not understanding other people's views. Um, and sometimes it is perceived that there is a lack of empathy um, or that autistic people don't have empathy. Um, that's actually a myth. With empathy, there are two components. And you would have learned a little bit about empathy within your MHFA course. M uh, empathy comprises two parts. One is cognitive empathy. Now, that's the thoughts, the processing of of uh, someone's feelings and then we've got what we call the effective empathy that's the feeling side of it autistic people are slow to process very often so we don't process the cognitive side of that very quickly but when we do get there we feel very often someone else's pain as if it's our own and um often take that pain home with us as well so we tend to be quite high on empathy just processing it slowly i generally describe this as, as being like um we're often late to the party but when we get there you know we're there um so sometimes i i sometimes view that as quite an offensive thing that people presume autistic people to lack empathy because um sometimes autistic people will be what we call super empaths um you cry they taste the tears um Difficulties with theory of mind are another factor that we come across with autism, um, often called mind blindness, and you will find a lot of work from Simon Baron Cohen about this. So the theory of mind test is often done uh, with children to actually establish whether autism is present, and it's called the Sally Ann test, and it's about um, seeing if the child can put their mind into the, uh, the mind of someone else and understand someone else's viewpoint. And actually, autistic adults can pass the Sally Ann test. But what I generally find with autistic adults is once it steps up to a level of, of um, sophistication, uh, the autistic brain falls down. And um, so we don't recognize ill intention till it's too late. Um, we don't recognize sometimes when we are being gaslighted, for example. So we do find that autistic people can be vulnerable to bullies um, and people with ill intention and not pick up on that till it's too late in the process because of a lack of theory of mind. But I have heard other people talk about theory of mind and say, well, actually, we all lack a theory of mind. That's how we developed communication, because we can't read other people's minds. Um, but interesting area if you want to have a look into that further. Um, autistic people uh, are very resistant and um, don't particularly like change. Um, small changes can feel like huge changes and it can take the person quite a while to get back into the routine if a change has been made. Um, don't tend to be spontaneous in thinking so because of, of that um, need to predict. So um, sometimes we need information in advance to be able to think about that. And we prefer to know about a change um, in advance rather than last minute changes. It can be extremely frustrating and highly stressful um, if a change is made last minute. Um, sometimes there's difficulties in, in being able to generalize information as well, um, perhaps because the focus is on, on the detail. Um, we mentioned uh, stims earlier, but there is something called spins as well that is featured within autism. And this is what we call, or it's an abbreviation for special interests, otherwise referred to as obsessive behavior. Um, obsessive behavior is just that. We can become very obsessive about certain things and um, to the detriment of many other things as well. Um, if you want to weigh into an autistic person, I would say the way in is through their obsessions. Um, obsessions in autism are different to obsessions in OCD, um, which is an anxiety disorder. Obsessions in autism make autistic people happy. Um, they may well have more than one obsession. They will wax lyrical about it. They will develop an encyclopedic knowledge of it. Um, and it will be a really important part of their life. I often say with autism, the Maslow hierarchy of needs does not look the same um, because their spins will be or their obsessions will be at the bottom with their basic needs. That's how important they are for autistic people. Autistic people also take things literally. Um, if road signs have been written poorly, they might be misinterpreted. Um, if information is ambiguous or lacking, 
um, or said in a certain way, they may take it literally. And that might include things like sarcasm, euphemisms and jokes. Um, if a joke is said to someone with autism in a deadpan way, um, often they, they might not get the joke or they might be last to get the joke. And they might feel quite humiliated by that as well, which then adds a little bit of, of further distress for the person. Um, so they tend to be more direct um, and need more direct from other people as well. Um, and can be quite rigid in their thought patterns. And it might appear, again, stubborn. Um, they cling to facts as well. Um, facts will be what they're looking for. So any ambiguity will be frustrating for an autistic person very often. Uh, other challenges, things like sensory overload, light, sound, noise, uh, um, temperature, too cold, too hot. Some people will have hypersensitivity and some people have uh, hyposensitivity. Uh, and we have a film that um, illustrates this here, um, particularly hypersensitivity to light and sound in this film. So a little bit like the simulation exercise you would have done in your MHFA regarding hearing voices, this is a simulation exercise of what it feels like to walk down the street if you are autistic. Um, mentioned comorbid illnesses uh, previously. There's a lot of comorbid specifically linked to autism as well. Um, anxiety, major one. Um, things like gastric problems, migraines, very, very common with autism. And for some people with autism, the anxiety won't ever go away. It will never be episodic. Um, just like the permanency of the autism, so too will be the anxiety. Um, Gender inequalities are quite key here as well, because a lot of the diagnosis has been linked to boys and men. For every one female that's diagnosed, there's about four or five men and boys who will be diagnosed. Um, and that's not because women don't have autism. It's because the tests were developed on boys. Um, we have been conditioned to think about the male phenotype of autism or the male presentation of autism. And we've not really applied the female thinking so, so much on this area. But when we do, we tend to find the women and the girls with it. Um, th there's a lot in this area and we could go into this area to, uh, uh, to quite a high level and talk about it further. Um, the other thing to keep in mind as well with autism, and I'm seeing an incredible amount of research on this at the moment, um, sad research that talks about the higher incidence of suicidal ideation in autistics and also the increased um, suicidality, so completed suicides in autistic people. Um, the most recent research I've come across is some Cambridge research that did uh, what we would describe as a psychological autopsy spoke to families and friends around the person who'd died of, as a result of suicide. And based on that information, we're able to establish that, was a, that there was a disproportionately high rate of undiagnosed autistics amongst a group of people who had completed suicide. Again, in, sub, in substantial numbers, that could be representative of the wider numbers around suicide and the higher incidence of autistics within those. And again, we've got another film about autism from the NAS, the National Autistic Society. And then we go on to an activity where we're going to get people to split up into groups and have a look at the two questions, which are what stigma experiences might a neurodivergent person experience and how might this impact, uh, impact them? And then we get a little bit of feedback. I will then tell my lived experience story of autism and I'm going to give you a very brief one of it at the moment. I am one of those uh, late diagnosed autistic females. I was diagnosed on the 22nd of June 2021. My 26 year old daughter was diagnosed two months later and my nine year old son was diagnosed three months after that. We received three autism diagnoses in 2021. And all my life, I have felt like I do not belong. I have experienced relentless anxiety. I've been misdiagnosed with anxiety disorders, but they are not because my anxiety is not episodic. It never, ever goes away. If you were supporting me as a mental health first aider, you would be supporting me to manage my anxiety. And sadly, from time to time, you would be supporting me with the suicidal ideation that I have. That is now explained um, by my being autistic and the fact that Autistic people living in a neurotypical world find that incredibly difficult and it can make life so much harder than it would ordinarily be. Um, so I've had those thoughts since I was an adolescent, but I now understand why. Um, I got a big answer to lots of why questions in 2021. It has been totally validating and totally explaining of my entire life. 
and illustrates that I've lived a life searching for who I was. Um, I searched in crime and criminology. I have a degree in criminology. And for the last 14 years, I've been searching in mental health. I also feel other people's pain as if it's my own. And it's absolutely no accident that I've come to do the work that I do today, which is to try and help reduce suffering in other people. Um, one of my personal ambitions at the moment is to help find other lost girls. We've been titled The Lost Girls, a lost generation of women who were missed by health, social care and education. And many of us sadly are lost in the mental health system. That's our presentation. Um, and I think that's a really important point for us to think about as mental health first aiders, because what it illustrates is it could be very likely that you are supporting someone who is undiagnosed, more so undiagnosed than diagnosed, I would actually say. Um, I wrote a memoir. I started writing a memoir um, in late September last year. And that was published over the summer this year in 2022. And it's called The Umbrella Picker. If you do want to learn more about my lived experience, the detail is in there, as only an artistic person would. So I'm going to leave that there. So um, I've told you a little bit about my lived experience there, but I'm just one artistic person. Um, you've met one, you've met one. Um, and I thought it'd be really nice to open some questions out to the wider neurodivergent uh, community. We've only got a small sample, I have to say, but I just wanted to, you to hear other people's voices and not just mine. So I put three questions out on social media and I asked the community, what is your greatest challenge or difficulty in being neurodivergent? What is your greatest strength or superpower that comes from you being neurodivergent? Just to say as well, some people reject that word. They say nobody has a superpower. I think that is the community trying to take the positives about who we are because the challenges can be so much. We look for the light. Um, and the last one is, what would you want the world to understand about neurodiversity or your specific neurodivergence? And we got some feedback from people. Kelly Swingler, at, um, who is a coach, speaker and author as well, and passionate about preventing burnout. Um, autistics are more prone to autistic burnout um, than neurotypicals or holistics. Um, and Kelly said, uh, the exhaustion and expectation from others to live like I'm not. So that was the greatest challenge and difficulty. She said in, in respect of what do you want the world to know, um, she wants the world to know that no one size fits all. Every brain is different, just as every person is. And we're not defined by the label we've, uh, we've been given. And then Nicola. Nicola Chamberlain uh, was a previous employee of MH Fangland, and she's also passionate about raising awareness. And for her challenge now, just, just to give you a little bit of background on Nicola, Nicola was recently diagnosed with the condition ADHD. So like myself, she's probably still processing a lot of that. And we often go through grief for the person that was, that we now know isn't. So it's a big process uh, to go through once you receive one of these diagnoses. And Nicola actually said uh, it changes day to day. Currently, I'm feeling that the emotional side of it is, is the challenge. The intense feelings, whether it's happiness, sand, uh, sadness, anger, frustration, it's a lot and it impacts everything. And she goes on to talk about the relationships there, her work, her mood and how much it's impacting. She also says the inability to switch my brain off is exhausting and overwhelming. Sometimes I get used to it. Other times I really struggle. I would ditto that as well. My brain does not stop unless I read. It's the only thing that gives me a, a temporary cessation to my overactive brain. Um, and she also says, I also don't think it is perceived as being as debilitating as it as it can be. Um, so that's another sort of key factor there. Um, what does she want the world to understand? She wants the world to understand how seriously it can impact uh, day to day and the intricate crossovers between different neurological conditions and mental health. A lot of young neurodivergent influencers put a positive spin on our disability, which is amazing, but it's also important that people see the difficult side of it too. And again, I would ditto that. Um, I describe autism as a rainbow. We've got the really positive side, like the um, excellent long-term memory, the pattern spot, uh, spotting, the determination. Um, but for me personally, that doesn't even come close to the, to the dark side and how difficult life is living with that condition. Um, it's almost like the silver lining, um, but it's not always enough. And then we've got Rachel Brown, who is an equality, diversity and inclusion person at Northumbria uh, University. And she says her greatest challenge is the intense exhaustion she experiences following a hyper focus. Um, biggest challenge is, is that 
Um, also, I've no in a have an inability to switch my brain off, which sometimes creates additional exhaustion, and I get stressed thinking about all the things I could worry about. And if for any reason I feel I don't have anything to worry about, then I worry about not having things to worry about. Can be ultra exhausting. Ditto that one as well. What would you want the world to understand? She wants the world to understand the immense challenge that having a neurodivergent condition, especially in her case, in addition to other disabilities, including physical and mental, can actually be so draining and exhausting that remaining positive can be very hard. And even for a disability advocate and an inclusion practitioner, it's hard to keep a positive mindset when it comes with challenges that we face on a daily basis. I'm hearing exhaustion across all of these and just really wanting the world to understand and this is my own couple of points um, on these. And I, I do ditto what other people have said as well. But my greatest challenge is people thinking I'm OK and I don't need support because I present as OK most of the time. Um, I struggle to keep that presentation up when I'm tired, uh, I have to say. If I'm exhausted or going close to burnout, it falls down. But 99% of the time I'm socially masking and I present as neurotypical I don't know how to switch that off after 45 years because it started when I was three years old. Um, I've got many masks and I've masked for so long and so much that I even mask in my dreams. Um, I wake up knowing I've been been masking. Um, and because I mask and I do it pretty well most of the time, people think I'm OK when I'm not OK. So that's really difficult because I won't always tell you if I'm not. Um, I can write it, but I can't say it. Don't know why. Again, the uh, difficulties expressing feelings, perhaps. Um, what would you want the world to understand about neurodiversity on your neurodivergence? I would like the world to understand just how hard, how difficult it is for us. We're not making out things are worse than they are. We're not being over dramatic. In fact, many times we feel like we're being a fraud. For years, I felt like a fraud. Um, but one thing you will learn from autistic people in particular is we are really honest. We never lie. We're not very good at it. We don't know how. Um, so we're honest. If we're saying we're not OK, we're, we're not OK. Um, and sometimes I end up feeling like I'm making out it's worse than it is um, and that I'm a fraud. And as I say, for years, I felt like that. And the diagnosis gave me um, a legitimacy. So on to some positive stuff. OK, so um, we have got these amazing things as well, these so-called superpowers. Um, most of us are not savants. So we're not talking Stephen Wiltshire level or, or Raymond Babbitt. Um, but we do have a little bit of what I call the sparkle. Um, we are empaths very often. We feel other people's pain and we end up working in the helping profession. Um, off the charts determination, that was one of mine that I put on there. I'm highly determined um, to the point of stubbornness, even to myself. Um, and um, sometimes we are very creative with our ideas. Um, we can be really innovative. We can look at things a different way to, to other people. And we're brilliant at hyper-focusing. We have what we call monotropic focus. And monotropic focus is where we reduce our senses down to one sense. So if I'm focused on something visually, everything else is out the window, um, that monotropic focus. And if it's my obsession, um, I can, I'm in the dan in danger of self-neglecting sometimes when I'm focused on something very heavily. Um, one of my other superpowers is the pattern spotting. Um, I can predict human behavior is my specialist area. Um, I've not got a very good theory of mind, but I am good, I am good at pattern spotting. So I can pick up on behaviors and um, working in the business world, it's quite useful because I can predict things before they happen. It looks like fortune telling, but it's not. It's it's pattern spotting. And under test, I can pattern spot 78% faster than my neurotypical counterparts. Um, and we love information. We love learning. Uh, we're often philomaths. We will learn about everything and anything. And we're quite good at retaining it as well. Um, we're like little sponges. Um, so we've got lots of different things going on, but different neurodivergent people will talk about different um, strengths that they have. So last activity is to get you thinking about what people have said and to think about how you would support someone who is neurodivergent. Um, you can think about that question more generally, or you can apply that to some of the people's feedback that's just been given um, in your groups. And the second one is to look at how you will influence positive change within your workplace. Um, so what can you do from a bigger picture point of view? What one thing could you take back today and do something positive about? 
even if that is maybe just learning a little bit more, um, what what could you do? So I'm going to leave that with you to be creative, have a chat together and see what comes out that will get the feedback. And then questions from anyone or questions afterwards, if people feel the need to uh, check anything else out. And the references for where we um, ascertained all that information. Um, of course, there's some lived experience stuff in there as well. And a big thank you for um, everyone for listening. And a big thank you to MH for England for allowing me to be part of this and for sharing my story. What is always valuable to MH for England and to myself as an instructor is your feedback. Uh, what did we do well? What could we improve? Anything else you'd like us to know? So there is a link here. I'll pop that in the chat. And if you could just take a couple of minutes to complete that. And I hope you've got a lot out of today's session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.